Revelation 4. After these things I saw, and behold, a door opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard is of a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show thee the things which must take place after these things. Immediately I became in the spirit, and behold, a throne stood in the heaven, and upon the throne one sitting, and he that was sitting like in appearance to a stone of jasper and a sardius, and a rainbow round the throne, like in appearance to an emerald, and round the throne twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones twenty-four elders sitting, clothed with white garments, and on their heads golden crowns, and out of the throne go forth lightnings and voices and thunders, and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, as a glass sea like crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes, before and behind. And the first living creature like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature having the face as of a man, and the fourth living creature like a living eagle, a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having respectively six wings, round and within they are full of eyes, and they see not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come, when the living creatures shall give glory and honor and thanksgiving to him that sits upon the throne, who lives to the ages of ages, the twenty-four elders shall fall before him that sits upon the throne, and do homage to him that lives to the ages of ages, and shall cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy will they were, and they have been created. So far the reading of the scriptures. <clears throat> When you think about it, it's a wonderful privilege to have a look in heaven tonight. You and me, we are very privileged people. And when you think about it, what a miracle it is in itself, that God could show these things, future events, to John when he was on Patmos. We have seen how in this book, the, Lord, the Lord's glory is revealed. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And even this chapter we have read tonight, as we also have expressed in our prayer, and shows the glory of the Lord Jesus. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Many people think that it is a throne and that the Father, God the Father, is seated on the throne. But it is God the Son, as you hope to see. It is the Lord Jesus, as you hope to see in chapter 5, the Lamb. And so, <clears throat> this revelation is an unveiling, disclosure of the glories of the Lord Jesus. And all through this book, we will see more of his glories. We have seen in chapter 1, we have seen uh, also... In chapter 2 and 3, uh, these different aspects of his glory. We have seen uh, also in connection with Philadelphia and even the way he presented himself to the Laodicean church. Many glories of the Lord Jesus has been displayed before our eyes. Now this chapter, again in a different way, shows the glories of the Lord Jesus. We have seen he is the supreme judge. And tonight we hope to see he is God himself on the throne, the supreme king and judge. We have seen in chapter 2 and 3 how we are living in, okay, I should go back to chapter 1, verse 19, the key of the whole book, where we see that the Lord himself divides the book in three parts. And so far we have seen part 1 and 2. Part 1 was the presentation of the Lord from glory to John in Patmos. So the Lord presented himself to John when he was in Patmos, on earth. He is the one who walks among the candlesticks on earth. The assemblies are not in heaven, they are on earth. And then we have seen the second part has to do with chapter 2 and 3, the things which are. And we have seen how in our days we live in a very special time set where three, four different phases of the church come together. And they all remain till the coming of the Lord. And after the rapture, we hope to speak, speak a, a little bit about the rapture tonight, the professing, the Christian profession still will be there and will be judged in the second part of the 70th week, probably the beginning of the 70th week, in God's governmental dealings. That's what you see in chapter 17 of Revelation. So, this is the connection with what we have seen so far. 
The things which are is a, discla- is a overview of the history of the church, and then this brings us then to this third part of the book, which is introduced here in chapter 4, verse 1, after these things. And as you have seen in connection with chapter 1, verse 19, that is the third part of the key the Lord has given there, the things that are about to be after these. So there is a clear link here with chapter 1, verse 19. As far as the chronology of the book is concerned, um, for those who didn't get the handout last time, I have a sheet on the table you can get later on, and you might use that for the studies of the book of Revelation. Many things are given in chronological order, but as we hope to see, I'll come back to these parts later on, but tonight we start now with a new uh, chapter, a new division of the book, and it is the introduction to the era of judgment. So we have seen what was, what John had seen on Patmos, the presentation of the Lord, the appearing of the Lord there, the things which are the present dispensation, chapter 2 and 3, and now we are going to speak about things which are going to happen after the rapture of the church. And so that's called here the first half of Daniel's 70th week. So that's just as a frame of reference. There are no proofs here on the sheet, but it helps you to have an idea where we are in the book of Revelation. So there's one more transparency for a little bit later. This chapter could be called the chapter of the... If you would have to write a name about the chapter, what name would you give it? It's the chapter of the throne. You find the throne 12 times in this chapter. The throne of God, 12 times. We have many times in the book of Revelation the number 12, which has to do with government, with administration. And it is very striking for me to see that the throne of God is referred to 12 times in this chapter. We find the throne of God, either with God seated on it or the Lord Jesus, the Lamb, on it, 42 times in the book of Revelation, 6 times 7. And then a few more references, three references in connection with Satan and two references in connection with the saints, seated on thrones, plural. But 42 times in this book, it's amazing, this book is really the book of the throne of God. It has to do with the government of God, the throne of God, and especially this chapter 4. So this, may, if you keep this in mind, deals with the throne of God. Now, this chapter is also an introduction to this whole portion running from chapter 4 to 19. It is uh, the introduction to the era of judgment, and therefore the church cannot be on earth during that time. We'll come back to that later on. But it is the introduction to that. And everything is seen now from the light of the throne. We are, John is called into heaven to see things from God's perspective. God's throne speaks of his authority, of his rule. And God's throne has been attacked in many ways. When we see the history of man, we can see that Satan attacked the throne of God already very early. Obedience is a principle which runs through the whole Bible. And God had given Adam and Eve a very special place as his representatives here on earth. And one of the key words there in Genesis 2 is obedience. Obedience to the God of the throne. But there we see how the fall interfered with the right of the throne. We see how sin really affected not affected, but attacked God's rights. It was rebellion against God's rights, disobedience. And so we see 6,000 years of human history, which in one way or or another uh, deal with this issue. Is God honored? Is our God's rights? Is the throne of God recognized? You see that Satan, he wanted to lift himself above the throne, Ezekiel 28. His pride and his aspirations and today many people deny altogether that there is a throne in heaven, that there is a God who rules. But for the believer, it's very clear that the throne is there. And what to me is so glorious about this chapter, this throne is there and cannot be affected by anything. Neither by sin, neither by the fall, neither by Satan's attacks, neither by all the forces Satan will mobilize against God. The throne is there in its stability, it is this calmness you find there in this atmosphere of heaven. Well, we read here in chapter 4, verse 1, John saw something. By the way, that's also a way to divide the book in paragraphs. Many times you see a pericope, paragraph is introduced with, I saw. John saw this. And behold, he asked our attention now for what's going to happen. A door opened in heaven. Well, I was going to say something else before we go on with this. In connection with this whole 
theme of chapters 4 to 19. I said this chapter 4 and 5 are an introduction. And when you keep in mind two important expressions we find in the scriptures, I just referred to them, Hebrews 1 verse 6. Again, when he brings in the firstborn into the habitable world, God is going to bring in the firstborn, his firstborn, into the habitable world. And chapter 6 to 19 deal with that. God is going to bring in his firstborn into the habitable world. And all these chapters, 6 to 19, are necessary for that. God is going to introduce his firstborn into this world. And another expression, Ephesians 1, verse 10, you have this purpose of God. And what is his purpose? To put under the feet of the Lord Jesus everything, the administration of the fullness of times, to head up all things in the Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. God is going to do this. But the way he does this, that is what we find in Revelation 6 to 19. So we see, this is God's purpose, this is God's plan. But from this perspective, from the throne, we have to have this impression first. All God's dealings start there. They do not start with us, they start from the throne. So therefore this call, that John is called, through this door opened in heaven. Now keep this in mind. Here the door is opened to let somebody in. You know, he sees the things there going on in this world, on this earth, and when is the heaven opened again? In chapter 19, to let somebody out. To me that is a very clear indication that this one portion, this portion starts here. The door is open and somebody is let in. And then in chapter 19, the heavens are opened and somebody is let out. And that is the Lord Jesus in verse 11, on a white horse, who is called faithful and true, and he judges and makes war in righteousness. Now, at that time, we will come with the Lord Jesus, as we see there, the armies who are with him, in verse 14, the armies which are in the heaven followed him upon white horses. So then the heaven will be opened, that the Lord will come out, and we with him. Now, I would suggest this to you, in this call to come up to heaven, there is an implication, this implies the rapture. I'm not saying that you have the rapture here explained. We find in John 14, verse 1 to 3, that the Lord says that I'm coming back and I'll bring you to the house of the Father. That is his promise. Well, this is not the house of the Father, but it is heaven. It is the throne room of God, the third heaven. So in order to get there, the rapture has to be, has to take place. We have in 1 Thessalonians 4, in 1 Corinthians 15, other references to the rapture. Philippians 3 verse 21 is very clear about it, that the Lord will come to change our bodies. And so, we will come back to that in connection with the 24 elders. We see there a company in heaven. Now, how to get there? You have to go through the door. And so, in this vision, we see also an illustration of what is going to happen the moment of the rapture. Here, of course, John entered in heaven. Only he received these visions. But it is at the same time an illustration of what's going to happen with you and me. There will be a voice, the trumpet call from God, and many different descriptions in connection with this voice, to call all the saints to heaven. We come back to that. And then, from heaven, we will see the scenes from chapter 6 to 19. And then, after these judgments, we will come back with the Lord on these horses. So, just to put it together in, in, a, in a brief way, you see the church in heaven in three different ways. You see the church in the 24 elders, part of the 24 elders. You see the church in chapter 19 as the bride of the Lamb, and there you have the, those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. So these are the other part of the 24 elders. And then you have these armies coming out of heaven. That's an other expression in connection with the assembly. And then later on, of course, we hope to see the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem. So this, fir- this trumpet call is an illustration of what will take place when the rapture will take place. So the rapture is not mentioned here, but presuppose. This book is not a book to um, explain doctrines. It speaks about these coming judgments, and it uses many symbols, as we've seen in chapter 1 already, to help us to understand about these judgments, to help us to understand God's ways in dealing with the earth and with the universe. But as far as the doctrine is concerned, John presupposes that we know about the rapture. And as I said, the rapture has to take place before the judgment will be executed 
on the earth. The church is not to be exposed to God's judgment. When you understand that the 70th week of Daniel, we have seen that in Daniel 9, has to do with God's ways, you know, with God's dealings. The church is not part of that. The church is part of God's counsel, of God's purpose. And what is left here at the rapture is only the apostate church, the professing nominal church, those who are not born again. They will be left here in this scene. Whereas the true believers, who are part of the true church, will be raptured when the Lord will come. And this is presupposed in this book. Well, just a practical point here in connection with verse 1. The first voice. What about listening to the voice of the Lord? We have heard the last time in chapter 3, verse 20. If anyone hear my voice. And we've mentioned now many ways we find, we hear the voice of the Lord in this book, and especially in John's writings. It's very interesting. And so the question could be asked, do we listen to the Lord's voice? And is he also for us the first voice? There are many voices in this world. But how important it is that he has the first voice? That he is the first one to listen to? Just the practical application. The invitation here, come up here. So we see here, literally, this is John who received this vision. But come up here, this will also happen when the Lord will come with this trumpet call, 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians, to call us up into the air. And then he will introduce us into the third heaven. But not only there, in the Father's house. He will say to us also, come up. And from that high perspective, as John in those days, we will see this whole scene. I have another illustration. In the book of Genesis already, we see Abraham is on the mountain where the Lord had talked with him, where the Lord had had communion with him, shared his thoughts with him. And from that mountain, in Genesis 19, he saw the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in a similar way, the church will be in heaven with the Lord to commune with him there on the mountain. And from heaven there, from the heavenly mountain, so to speak, we will see these events from chapter 6 to 19 take place. Another example we find of somebody who was taken up into the third heaven and saw there certain things is Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. He did not even know if it was in his body or outside the body, and we don't know even if that was in connection with John. He was on Patmos. We don't know if he stayed there in his body on Patmos and the Lord took his, somehow, he was in the spirit there, in his own spirit there, we don't know. Or if he was really taken away physically there, we don't know, as is the case with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. But we know for sure that John was there and that he saw these things. And from this heavenly perspective, from heaven, he sees the things which are going to take place on earth. But before the Lord deals with that, he shows the scene in heaven, as we see. So I will show thee the things which must take place after these things. So that is this whole scene of chapter 6 to 19. All these things, and even after, he sees there. The Lord shows him there. But one of the reasons, also the arguments we could add to the fact that the church cannot be here on earth, then, is the blessed hope. We know the Lord Jesus, the blessed hope. And to suppose that the church would be here on earth, that all these judgments would come over the church, is in flagrant contradiction with this concept of the coming of the Lord as the blessed hope. There are so many passages, First Thessalonians 1, where we see that he will uh, save us from the wrath to come. Revelation 3, we have seen in verse 10, I also will keep thee out of the hour of trial. So it's not only the great tribulation, it's the whole period of what we call the 70th week of Daniel. Church will be there in heaven. Now in verse 2, immediately I became in the spirit. We see here John in the right spiritual condition. And we have seen how John is an example for the believers, for you and me. Because to understand this book, we have to be a slave, a bondman, you have seen chapter 1. We have to be in the right spiritual condition, as he was on the Lord's day there, in chapter 1, verse 10. And here again, excuse me, in connection with this new vision, we see that he is in the right spiritual condition. So the Lord brings him to the right position in heaven, and he is in the right spiritual position and uh, condition. And we have to have the right spiritual condition in order to take in these things, in order to digest these things, to realize what, what will go on. We see here this heavenly tribunal. We could call it God's supreme court, or the throne room of God in the third heaven. It's impressive when you think of that, that God allows us to look right into his throne room, and behold, a throne stood in heaven. That is what I meant, this stability. This throne was always there, at least from Genesis 1 verse 1, and will always be there. 
God's reign will never stop. Even after the millennium, the eternal state, God is going to reign. Of course, in a different way, but his rule will always be there. You could study many scriptures about the throne. We have no time to do that, but they are very helpful to appreciate what the tr throne means and who is seated on the throne. In the Psalms, we have several references, and I was just going to quote one or two. First, I found in chapter 47, where we have, in verse 8, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. And in Psalm 45, this well-known uh, verse 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That is very important for us. When we go through scenes of trial to realize that in God there is stability, nothing will change there. Nothing can affect the throne. In the Old Testament, we have a marvelous uh, illustration of what the throne is. You know what that illustration is in the Old Testament? The illustration of the throne of God in the Old Testament. Starts with an A. The Ark. Remember? The Ark is the throne of God. The Ark was taken away in those days by the Philistines. Well, this throne is in heaven. Can never be taken away by any enemy. How great he may be. This is God's throne. And the Ark was the expression of this here in this earth. The Ark had to was a testimony of God's throne, of God's right among his people, and a testimony. It will be very interesting to study the ark all through the Old Testament, to see this in connection with God's throne. We see in the Psalms that God was seated upon this throne uh, between the cherubim. We hope to see the cherubim later on in connection with the four living creatures. And so that is, was even God's dwelling place. It was God's throne, but it was also connected with his dwelling place, because where God dwells, he has to reign, to rule. God cannot dwell there where his rule is not accepted, you see. And therefore in, the, in Psalm 132, in connection with the millennium, you will see that where the ark is brought by David, it speaks of the throne, it's there where God dwells, it's there where God blesses. So the ark in the Old Testament really speaks of this throne of God established here on the earth. But this moment is still future. The ark of God, the throne of God, also called the ark, by the way, in Revelation 11, is in heaven. And God is going to establish his throne here on earth. And it's your and my privilege to carry the ark today. Like the, Le the Levitical priests in the Old Testament, they carry the ark. And we, as Christians, may give a testimony to God's rights in this world. Where God is rejected, where the throne of God is rejected, we may be a testimony and in that sense, in that sense, carry God's ark as a testimony here on earth. We are very privileged. And so we give a testimony of God's right. Maybe I could just show this in connection with our subject. We have said the book of Revelation uses many symbols. But many symbols go back to the illustrations of the, uh, of, uh, the tabernacle. And you have a reference here then, the ark of the covenant, the throne of God. You find the ark of the covenant in Revelation 11. You find also, really, the tabernacle system was a display of God's glory. Well, this whole book speaks about God's glory, and especially here, this chapter 4. It's God's glory, revelation of God's glory. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, saw God's glory. And in John 12, it says, he saw his glory, the glory of the Lord Jesus. And so tonight, we see God's glory, God on the throne, but we know it is the Lord Jesus. So the cherubim, you find also in the Ark of the Old Testament, in the veil, also on the, on the Ark. They were also woven into the veil. You find the altar of incense, especially in Revelation 8 and 9. You find the seven lamps, seen them here in chapter 4, the connection with the golden candlestick. Of course, there is a reference also to what we have seen in the church, chapter 2 and 3, but especially in connection with things in heaven, you find the seven burning lamps. We see the sea of glass. We have the laver in the Old Testament. Here we have the sea of glass. We have the <coughs> altar. Many times in the book of Revelation, the altar. So there are many references to the tabernacle in the Old Testament. If you are familiar with the tabernacle, it will help you to understand the book of Revelation. Another passage which helps us a lot to understand this book is Ezekiel 1 to 10, where we have many parallels with what's going on here in Revelation 4. But the scriptures always add, so here you have the fullest revelation. What was revealed in uh, the days of Ezekiel was more limited compared with the revelation we have here. And then the throne of God today is a throne of grace, as you know. Romans 3 shows that 
The judgment seat has become a mercy seat, but it is still the throne. And today Hebrews 4 shows that from the throne of God, we receive now grace, because it is a throne of grace. But here in heaven, it's no longer a throne of grace. The moment when the rapture will have taken place, <coughs> this throne will be characterized by judgment. We see that later on, these lightnings, verse 5, coming from the throne. So the first thought I want to underline here is the throne in connection with judgment. It's God's tribunal, as we have seen. It's, we have many references to that, the tribunal. But it is also a temple setting. We have seen already in chapter 1 that the Lord is presented as the priest king. And even here the throne has references to what happens in the temple. And at the same time we have reference to, references to God's palace, his, the, the supreme court. So it is not the Father's house. I, I think you will understand that the Father's house is to do with dwelling. But of course you can only, God can only dwell there where his rights are recognized in connection with the throne. Now, the one who is seated upon the throne, we, will hear, we hope to see at the end of the chapter, is God himself, verse 11. O oh, our Lord and our God. Thou art worthy. So, it's God himself. But my suggestion is, when we see God, it is through the Son. Hebrews 1, verse 3 shows very clearly that God is seen in the Son. God speaks in Son. In Colossians 1, you see that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in the Lord Jesus bodily here on earth. That is an additional thought. So when you see somebody on the throne, it will be God himself, and that is God the Son, but it is in connection with the incarnation. We cannot see God except we would see the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is God, and through him we see God himself, and so this is in itself a subject to study. But it is God the Son on the throne. Verse 3, He that was sitting like in appearance to a stone of jasper. And this is going to help us to understand it's God himself. The jasper and the sardius stone, when you go back to the Old Testament, to uh, Exodus 28, you will see the first stone mentioned there is the jasper, that is in the breastplate, twelve stones, reflecting God's glory in his people, in his redeemed people here on earth, and the last stone is the sardius stone. And these stones go together with the tribes, the first Reuben, the last, Benjamin. And both stones would speak also of the Lord Jesus. He is the true Reuben, the true son. And he is the true Benjamin. And so we see, and that's often the case with John's writings, we see in the humanity of the Lord Jesus, at the same time, what he is as God. He is the first and the last. He is the Alpha and the Omega. But it is mixed, as it were, with his humanity. He is the true Reuben, firstborn, and the true Benjamin, connected with the Sardis stone. The stones you find also in Revelation 21, sometimes the order is different, but it has to do with a reflection of God's glory. I think what God's Spirit wants to convey to us here is this. He does not give a description of the one who is seated on the throne. He gives suggestions. He uses symbols and these uh, precious stones to convey the majesty of the one who is seated on the throne. God himself cannot be described. So we see... The Spirit uses symbols to help us to understand the glory, the majesty of the one who is seated on the throne. Verse 3. So the one that was sitting. It's amazing to me when you read the epistle to the Hebrews to see that the Lord Jesus is seated there. So we see him there as man crowned with glory and honor. But at the same time he is God. And this is underlined here in chapter 4. The one who is seated there is God. He is the eternal king. First Timothy 1 and 6 you find God as the king. Here you have the eternal king on his throne. And these stones help us to understand his glory. You find his glory in creation in Ezekiel 28. There you find many of these stones mentioned. You find his glory in the redemption, as I mentioned in the breastplate. And you find his glory in the future expressed in the church of God. The church having God's glory. The stones will be found there again. But the one here is seated, he's seated there, he's sitting there. We have seen it in Daniel 7, and in the end of the chapter I'd like to come back to that, because God himself is seated there, but he is man at the same time. So let us study these scriptures and be impressed by the glory of God, which revealed is revealed to our eyes here. There was another verse I'd like to mention. Uh, when you study Ezekiel 1, you see that this glory went always straight. And so we read in James 1 verse 17 that with God, there is God the Father, is no a uh, shadow of turning. There is in God's dealings, in God's actions, in God's ways, this straightforwardness.
But at the same time, you see in Ezekiel, this wheel. And I would suggest you the rainbow, which is round, it's like a halo, they're around 30, uh, 360 degrees. It's not the rainbow as we know it, uh, which is only 180 degrees approximately. But this is a, uh, entirely circle around the throne. And so we have these two thoughts. God is straight in his judgment, as we find in Ezekiel 1. But in Ezekiel 1 you see also the circle, the wheel of God's providence. And this wheel you find here suggested in the rainbow, which is called in the Greek an iris, like the iris of your eye, entirely round. And the rainbow has to do with God's dealings with the earth. You remember the first time the rainbow is mentioned in the scriptures? It was after the flood. So God brought blessings to this earth after the flood. And so this symbol here, or the rainbow, is a symbol of what God is going to do. God is going to bless this earth. But first he will have to judge, as we see from verse 5 and so on. But before the judgments take place, we see here, we are reminded of God's faithfulness. The, re the rainbow reminds us of God's faithfulness and that God is going to bless after the judgment. Another point could be mentioned in connection with the rainbow, the emerald. You see, the rainbow here is light green. The emerald probably is light green. Sometimes there are some who think that it was entirely transparent and then it would be like a crystal and then reflect all the different colors, of course, as a true rainbow does. But maybe it was a real green rainbow. And green is very a peaceful. It's not for nothing that green peace, green, uh, has adopted this color of green. Green is the color of creation of the of the earth. It's a color which gives rest. And so God would use this color even here. This whole throne is the throne of God and there is peace, there is rest. It's the king of heaven. It's also the true Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of Salem, the king of peace. And this rainbow reflects all these thoughts. So God's providential dealings in connection with this thought of a wheel, God's faithfulness that he's going to bless, but for, uh, this emerald also speaks of something else. It was the fourth stone in chapter 21 and also in, in Exodus 28. It's the fourth stone. And the fourth stone was for Judah. And we hope to see in Revelation 5 the Lord Jesus as the lion from the tribe of Judah. So there is an, another thought in connection with the emerald. Now verse 4, round the throne, 24 thrones. So there you see a company very closely linked to the throne of God. So we have seen the one who is on the throne, sitting there. We have seen what is round the throne, immediately around the throne, the rainbow. And then we see round the throne, these 24 thrones. And there we see those who are seated on these thrones as kings. We have seen that the believers here in heaven are seen as kings and priests. Now, we see many references to that here in chapter 5, 4 and 5. Here the emphasis is on the fact that they are kings. They have crowns in verse 4 at the end. And in chapter 5, you will see that they will be priests and worshippers. Now, who are these 24 elders? There's lots of controversy about this, but I'm going to give you a few suggestions. We have seen that the number 12 is very prominent to this book. From, uh, 12 has to do with completeness in administration. But here it's not only 12, it is 2 times 12. And so that is even a perfect testimony in connection with this. Now, we have to keep in mind many other scriptures to understand what these 24 elders could be. But when you realize that in chapter 19, you don't find them anymore. It's a company in heaven, but there you see that there are those who are invited to the marriage supper, and there are those who belong to the marriage, to the bride. So that helps us already to understand that there are two different companies. The number two, uh, two times twelve, uh, refers to that already. There is two different companies, but seen together here. And when we know, for example, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 refers to those who uh, passed away in Christ, who died in Christ, then we may suggest that it implies the Old Testament believers as well. Because the expression in Christ is wider than in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, that is what refers to the church exclusively. But the expression in Christ has to do with all those who are, who God sees in Christ. 
And that implies the Old Testament believers. There is in Hebrews 11 a very important verse at the end of chapter 11 which says that the Old Testament believers cannot come to perfection without us. So the moment that the church, the believers of this church period, will come to perfection, the Old Testament believers will come to perfection. Then there's another verse I'd like to mention there. Okay, I mentioned it already. 1 Corinthians 15, with this trumpet call in connection with 1 Thessalonians 4. Those in Christ implies Old and New Testament believers. But especially when you keep in mind that at the end, in Revelation 19, this company is seen in two portions, the invited and the bride, it's clear that we see them as Old Testament believers as the invited and the New Testament believers as the bride. So these 24 thrones, and we will come uh, back many times to these elders, here we see the thrones are not empty. You remember in Daniel 7 that we saw the same session. We saw the throne, we saw the Ancient of Days on the throne, we saw another coming, the Son of Man, who was also the Ancient of Days then, there's a, a mystery, but then these thrones, plural, were empty. Here we see the thrones are occupied with these Old and New Testament believers. And so the rapture, as I said in the beginning, is presupposed here. That the rapture, these Old Testament believers will go with us. That doesn't mean that they have exactly the same place with the church, but in this context, in connection with the throne of God, they have the same place. They are elders. Elders would suggest maturity, spiritual maturity and insight, in spiritual intelligence also. They are not babies in the faith. They have matured. They have had their experiences with God. And especially the Old Testament believers, you see how many experiences they had with God. Hebrews 11 is full of it. And later on in the book we see that this intelligence is a real thing. And even John asks questions to them. Many proofs will be seen of their uh, insight and spiritual intelligence. They are also priests clothed with white garments. We will see more about the priestly functions in chapter 5 and later on also. They will be worshippers. Many times in this book we see how they will fall down and worship. And on their heads, golden crowns. I think that refers to the fact that they are seen as kings. But it might also refer to the fact that they are overcomers. They are seen here in heaven. They had their experiences on earth and now they are rewarded by the Lord having received these crowns. In verse 5, we see, out of the throne go forth lightning. So here we see the true character of the throne. That today, the throne is a throne of grace. Are explained, which are the seven spirits of God. You'd say there's one spirit, it's true. Ephesians 4 and many other passages. But we have seen in chapter 1 already, in connection with these judicial dealings, we see this completeness, this perfection, in connection with God's dealings, God's ways. We see this sevenfold perfection. And we have referred to Isaiah 11, where you have these seven spirits. One spirit, but seen in a sevenfold way. And these seven lambs would speak about exposing. God in judgment is going to expose everything. It speaks about the searching, the fire, the burning fire, the testing. These judgments speaks about this searching and testing way of God's dealings and that God discerns everything. So all these symbols help us to understand that we have to do with uh, the omniscient God in this chapter, the omnipotent God, and the greatness of God is again underlined here. But here we see the emphasis on the Spirit. The Spirit, uh, everything will be executed in the power of the Spirit. And then in verse 6, before the throne. So you have these lamps before the throne, burning there all the time, but now it is something else before the throne, as a glass sea, like crystal. These believers there in heaven will not need any purification. This glass sea, as I mentioned on the transparency, would be parallel to what you have in the Old Testament, the labor. The labor was necessary for the priests. They could only enter into the sanctuary through passing first this washing, and then they could serve inside. But here this purification is no longer necessary. In heaven, everything will be in full harmony to God's thought. But we have still this, <coughs> this reminds us of the need for purity. You cannot approach God, you cannot have access unless you pass this sea. And so this would speak about fixed purity, a state of fixed purity. But also everything is transparent there. Nothing is hidden anymore. Everything is dealt with. There is this fixed purity. No hindrance allowed. And also this is the way of access. There's another interpretation which is, which is very interesting, which links this glass sea, of course we link it with the labor in, in the book of Kings and Chronicles, it is literally mentioned, the sea there, but it could be linked also with this concept of the firmament. In the book of Job and also in Ezekiel 1, when we see this throne, 
vision, we see the, the firmament as crystal. So, and then on top of that, the throne. There might be a reference to that at the same time. And in the midst of the throne, so now we see something in the midst. We have seen one on the throne, what's going on before the throne, around the throne, but now also in the midst of the throne. And around. <clears throat> this is a symbolical description, I think, of, in these living creatures, of several attributes you find in God. So I'll explain that in more detail. Before the throne now, and in the midst, and around the throne. Four living creatures. Or you could translate four living beings. I know animals, as certain translations have, they are living beings. And these living beings have here several characteristics. In Ezekiel, a portion that goes parallel with this, you find <coughs> that they are described as children. In Isaiah 6, a passage I refer to, uh, where Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, we find seraphim. And you find both aspects back in the description here of these living creatures. In these living creatures, something of God's glory is reflected. Something of God's attributes. The first time you find the cherubim is in Genesis 3 already, where there was this drawn sword to bar the way to the tree of life. You have the cherubim on the throne, Exodus 25 as I mentioned, and in the veil also. So the cherubim we find maintain God's rights. They always maintain God's rights. They maintain God's holiness. And in a general sense you could say they maintain God's glory all the time. And a little bit later on we see how they do this, even by saying holy, holy, holy. They are seen here as being full of eyes. So <clears throat> these living creatures which reflect much of God's glory and maintain God's glory are characterized by the fact that they have a fullness of vision, a fullness of discernment. That's also something you find in Ezekiel. And therefore I think some would think that it's the highest order of angels, but it's also qualities you find in God himself. Because we read in the Old Testament sometimes that God's eyes go through the whole world and he sees everything. It's the same thought. So what is of God really is, re is seen here in these living creatures. They represent God in that sense, who discerns everything, who notices everything. All the details, there is nothing which can be hidden. Psalm 139 you could read alongside with this. Nothing can be hidden before God and before the executors of his glory, the cherubim here. Before and behind. So whatever way you look at them, they are characterized by this fullness of discernment, intelligence and vision. So this would really uh, fall in line with God's omniscience. And God uses these living creatures in connection with the fact that he is the omniscient God. And when God goes his way, as I said, his straight way, when you look at the back, it's still okay. When you look in front, he's still in control, before and behind. And then the first living, so now the order is given, the first living creature, like a lion. So you have <coughs> here certain different aspects of these living creatures in connection with God's government. And we see the same uh, attributes in the gospel. Back here in Ezekiel 1, but you find them also in the gospel. And therefore, I, I, I think that what you see in the Gospels of the glory of God in grace is here seen in the living creatures of God in judgment. So we see the glory of God in grace, and then you find the same symbols in the Gospel, but in here you find the glory of God in judgment, in these living creatures. The first is like a lion. You find the Lord Jesus, the lion in Matthew, the true king, and so that speaks of the power, the power and majesty so when God's going to deal in judgment, it's with power and majesty. Not in grace anymore, as in Matthew, but in power and majesty of judgment. And he will use the angels for that. It's very uh, interesting to me to see that the angels in the Bible are also seen in this powerful and majestic way. And also in the other ways, as we see in the living creatures. The second is characterized by the calf, which has to do with service. The angels are servants, Hebrews 1. And as the Lord was a servant here in grace, these living creatures will serve God in connection with his judgment. It speaks also about the perseverance in which God will deal. The stability, and immutability of these ways in judgment. The third living creature is here compared with a man, at the face of a man. There you see this human wisdom and intelligence. As you see in Luke's gospel, you find now... This wisdom seen in the living creature when God applies and executes judgment. So spiritual, intelligence, wisdom, fullness of it. And the fourth, and that's also what you see in the angel, this flying eagle, you remember how the angel came to Daniel in Daniel 9, flown, 
So you see these four different aspects also in connection with the angel. The flying eagle we find in John, in John's Gospel, not only the fastest, but the heavenly man there, the Lord Jesus. And so here these heavenly creatures will be used in their swiftness, their fastness, to execute God's judgment. Unexpected ways. The eagle sometimes deals very unexpectedly with prey. So these living creatures uh, um, represent God's qualities in judgment. And they are used by God, uh, no doubt angels used by God, but they are seen here as being very close to God, as we see even in the midst of the throne, that shows that they are very close to to God's glory and God's holiness. In verse 8, the four living creatures are going to honor God now. It says here, each each one of them having respectively six wings. So here you have the seraphic uh, aspect, as you find in Isaiah 6. Seraph means something like fiery ones, or what burn. So you find that especially in connection with God's holiness, Isaiah 6. The cherubim in connection with God's righteousness, with God's glory. And so these living creatures have here another aspect. The six wings are all round and within, full of eyes. Again, these eyes of uh, inward and outward discernment. They discern God's glory inwardly and they maintain God's holiness also outwardly. So again, also in connection with God's omniscience, as I mentioned earlier. And they cease not. You see, as long as there is no harmony between heaven and earth, they will not cease to say, day and night, holy, holy, holy. Till this holiness of God will be established publicly in the millennium, and especially in the eternal state, these living creatures will have no rest. They go on to say this, holy, holy, holy. You may refer this to the Trinity. It's to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. The Trinity on the throne. But as I said, when we see God, it is through the Son. And then also in connection with this, it's Lord God Almighty. Again, this threefold aspect of God, as we've seen in chapter 1 already. And another way of seeing God, who was, who is, and who is to come. So in these three different ways, God is seen, it's always holy. By the way, this is the first doxology, as you have in the scriptures, in heaven. We have seen in chapter 1 already, this outburst of praise to him who loves us. Well, that's here on earth. But here is the first doxology in heaven. And the living creatures, they speak about God. I just wanted to underline this. They say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Maybe they address him, but often they speak about God. And we see the elders speak to God in a more direct way in verse 11. That is the second doxology here in heaven. And in chapter 5, we hope to see three more. So they speak about God's attributes and they ascribe glory, honor, and thanksgiving to him. So even these high creatures, they ascribe thanksgiving to God. When I read that, I was amazed to see them. And how much more this would apply to us. How much reason do we have to give thanks to God, realizing that we are his creatures. And these high creatures, these living creatures there, these living beings, maintaining God's honor and glory, they ascribe also thanksgiving to him that sits upon the throne, who lives to the ages of ages. He is the living God. Matthew 16, it's, by the way, a very interesting study to see the living God through the scriptures. Here he is upon the throne, who lives to the ages of ages. But now, what do the elders do in verse 10? The 24 elders shall fall before him. There is worship. They go a step further. And the elders, many times here in this book, are characterized by worship. And they do not only ascribe glory to God and honor, but always the motive of their worship is given. Here in verse 11, the motive is given. But before we go uh, to verse 11, just verse 10, they fall before him who sits upon the throne. So here they fall down before God, who is on the throne, the almighty God, the omniscient God, and do homage to him that lives to the ages of ages. But then there's something more. They fall down, but that's not all. They cast the crowns before the throne. We have seen they are kings, but they don't claim any glory for themselves. They give all honor and glory to the one on the throne. That's a beautiful trait here. And that is helpful for us. How high our position may be, how high our dignity, we will always give honor and glory to the Lord. Here, God. In chapter 5, you'll see, see it, the Lamb. Now, verse 11, there the reason of their worship is given. Thou art worthy, O our Lord. It's also an expression of intimate relationship. O our Lord. It's an affectionate way to speak about the Lord. In the New Testament, we have only four times that it said, My Lord. And when Paul speaks about our Lord, 
it's in an affectionate way that he speaks about. And so here they speak in an affectionate way about the one who sits on the throne, says, Our Lord and God, thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power. And now the motive, for thou hast created all things. So here we see they are honoring God, worshiping God on, on their faces there before the throne as their creator. And there are two things mentioned here. Thou hast created all things. So we see him as the creator. And then it says, for thy will they were and they have been created. So if you please, even three facts they mention. Thou hast created all things. No question about that. And uh, for those who are interested, we cannot go into the details, but I made a short outline of Act 17, where we see God as creator, as sustainer, as ruler, and also as judge and savior. And all these aspects we find back here in this chapter. He is the true God creator, the true ruler, the true judge also, and the sustainer of everything. And as savior, he is seen in chapter 5. For thy will they were. So here we have the fact they were. It's the fact of creation, but in the connection of God's will. God has created everything for his will. More details you can find in Colossians 1 verse 16, where you find wonderful things in connection with the fact that the Lord Jesus has created everything in his own power, but also he was the executor of the whole process of creation, and he did it for his own glory. But here it says, this implies, for thy will. An other interesting study would be to go through the scriptures and see God's will. Here we see that even the whole creation was for his will. And so we are now to live for God's will as his creatures. And of course, so more in connection with redemption, to do his will. And then it says they have been created. That means they had a definite beginning. So in contrast to evolution, where they say that matter is eternal, we see that things had a definite beginning. They have been created. And John 1 adds some aspects to that, the glory of the Lord Jesus, that nothing existed without him. Hebrews 1, all these passages are wonderful passages to give us more detail about the greatness of our Creator. And now this question to finish with. When we see the Lord Je when we see God the Creator, who do we see actually? We see the Lamb. And that is the chapter, uh, the secret of chapter 5. We stand here, beloved, before a mystery. As I said, God cannot be seen in himself. First Timothy 6 shows very clearly that he is invisible and cannot be seen by any creature. And so God can only be seen in the person of the Son in connection with incarnation. And so, there we see this mystery. We see the Ancient of Days, God himself, but when we see him on the throne, we see there the Lord Jesus, the man on the throne, the Lamb in verse 5, chapter 5. And so we see these two great subjects, the Creator, Redeemer. About the Redeemer, we hope to speak next time then. But the Creator is here in chapter 4. But the Creator is the Lord Jesus. And that is one of uh, John's special privileges. The Apostle John, his writings are given in a very special way to present the greatness of the person of the Lord. He is God and man in one person. And that is, uh, in so many ways, we have seen it already in these early chapters of the book of Revelation, but it goes through the whole book that John always shows the Lord Jesus is God and man in one person. You cannot divide it. And so we see here really the glory of God, the glory of the throne, and this is the introduction, together with chapter 5, of course, from where the judgments are going to be executed. But it ends here with a note of worship. And let us end tonight also with a note of worship. We are very privileged to see the throne, to see the one on the throne. We are very privileged to know that we will have a place there around the throne. And beloved, how great this is, that we may walk in the light of the throne. I know this is future. Chapter 4 is, af is after the rapture. But we may walk in the light of these things. As Paul did, he walked in the light of God, of the judgment seat. He was walking in the light of the judgment seat. So it was a reality for him. And he went his way in that light. And so these future events may have a practical impact on our life today. Knowing that we will be there around the throne, knowing God's thoughts, it may have a practical impact on our daily life today. And in connection with this throne, I was going to say one thing which I forgot here. The fact that they 
cast the throne, the crown before the throne, to me would also indicate that this session of the believers before the judgment seat of Christ will have taken place then already. So the rapture is presupposed, and the fact that they have crowned, uh, excuse me, crowned, presupposes that they have been presented already before the tribunal seat, Second Corinthians 5, that they have received these crown, this crowns, this crowns then, and then they cast them before the, the, the Lord here on the throne. So this presupposes the rapture and even the appearing before the judgment seat of Christ in Second Corinthians 5. So let's stop here then, and if there are any additions or questions, if you can compare this with a palace, you find a part of the palace is uh, reserved for the daily duties of the king, where you have the throne room, and sometimes it's not even connected with the palace. The palace often is just the dwelling place of the king, and his throne room is somewhere else. So my suggestion would be then, in connection with our dwelling place, we have the father's house, and in connection here with the universe, with the things which are which deal with the universe, with this earth also, we see it's com- it comes from the throne. So the throne is not connected with God's dwelling place, but has to do with God's judgment, as you see here, and has to do with God's ruling. And you see it in a judge. A judge, where he works, is not necessarily where he dwells. And so also in, in connection with God, he is judge, but where that takes place is not necessarily where he dwells. That's all that I was trying to say. And in connection with this, the believers today are linked with the Lord Jesus as a judge, so they have a place around the throne, but they are also linked with the Lord Jesus where he dwells. So they have a place in the house of the Father. The the, the real secret, or the key, is to understand how closely we are linked to the Lord Jesus. We are the queen, which will be in his dwelling place, and we are also linked with him because he is the supreme judge. And he will be the supreme general in, Genesis, in uh, Revelation 19. We will link with him also. That's, that's the secret. No? No. The New Jerusalem has to do with administration. And has to do with uh, uh, sharing of blessings in the universe. And I think the Father's house goes beyond that. The Father's house was a concept from before the foundation of the world. Father's house, God was always there. Even before the foundation of the world. And so that is an added dimension which you do not find in the book of Revelation. Now, they were prepared from before the foundation of the world. But they were only uh, accessible through the work of the Lord Jesus. We would never have access there when the Lord Jesus would not have come. And I think this is also important. Uh, maybe I could add this. Uh, the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. And therefore we don't find the rapture there. Uh, the rapture has to do with the privilege side. And so, as we don't find here the Father's house, the Father's house has to do with privilege. In that same sense, we don't find the rapture here, literally, because that is the privilege side. Here we have God's dealings, God's ways in connection with man in responsibility. And that's an other perspective. I just wanted to add that to you. And you may think about this because many believers are confused. You see, many believers, they mix prophetic events with the rapture. They do not see that the church, as such, from God's perspective, is from before the foundation of the world, and as such has nothing to do with God's governmental dealings. The rapture itself is not a prophetic event. It has nothing to do with the fulfillment of the prophetic clock. And so Daniel, Daniel's week, as we have seen in Daniel 9, has to do with these prophetic events. And the book of Revelation has to do with the prophetic events. And therefore I said, you have to understand the other parts of the scriptures to see that the rapture has taken place in the meantime, but it is not discussed here because it is not as such a prophetic event. And when we see the church here on earth, or the church as an object of God's judgment, it has to do with the profession, or it has to do with the responsibility. But it is never from the perspective of God's counsel and God's purpose. Unless you come then to the eternal state, of course, in Revelation 21. I will give first one example, and then come back to that point. In Revelation 20, you will see uh, another group of believers in heaven. Those who will die during the Great Tribulation, or during the seven weeks, will uh, be resurrected again, and they will have a place in heaven. So, my point would be this. To be in heaven does not necessarily mean that you have to belong to the church. Okay, that's my first point to make. And Revelation 20 supports that view. There will be even another category of believers in heaven. Okay, then the second point is this. When you go to Hebrews 11, 
you find that the uh, patriarchs uh, understood by faith that God had reserved a higher portion for them. They were they came to the land, Abram came to the land, and then being in the land of promise, he was there as a stranger, as a pilgrim, because then he understood that God had reserved a higher portion for him, a heavenly portion. So there you find a heavenly uh, fatherland, the heavenly city, and so on. And so I would link that also with the Old Testament believers, that God has reserved something for them in heaven. And when you understand that, then the connection with these passages like Hebrews 11 verse 40, which show very clearly they cannot come to perfection without us. Now, when will we come to perfection? At the moment that our bodies will change, according to Philippians 3 verse 21, that's the moment we come to perfection. And so then they come to perfection too. And then when you link this with Revelation 19, there you see these two groups. How can they be in heaven? How can the invited guests be in heaven? When How, how can they come there? Unless it would be through the rapture. And so when you understand then that those who uh, die in Christ are First Thessalonians 4, and there are also mentioned that these two categories, I just wanted to draw your attention to that because this might help also. It says uh, in First Thessalonians 4, verse 16, the dead in Christ shall raise. But in verse 14 it says, those who sleep in Jesus, will, God will bring with him. Now, those who sleep or have fallen asleep in Jesus refers to those believers in those days, the Christians in Thessalonica, who had passed away. And so that would represent all the believers of the present day. They have fallen, who, who, who fall asleep, they have, been fall, they have fallen asleep in Jesus. Whereas the expression in Christ, of course, implies them too, because they have fallen asleep in Christ as well. But the expression in Christ is as such wider and implies also the Old Testament believers. You find uh, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 15 also a reference in Christ. So in Christ, everybody who is in Christ will be risen. God will raise him because he's connected with Christ. But it doesn't mean that he will belong to the church. And so actually all those who will, who will be raised will also be found in heaven. That is my point. They will be raised but then also be found in heaven. And this first resurrection will come to a finish then, Revelation 20, with this last group who will be enjoying this, what the Bible calls first resurrection. Is that uh, helpful? And uh, maybe I could add one more thing in connection with the elders. Uh, I don't know if there is a question about that. Maybe I should have waited. <laughs> if you have a question about the elders, or another question. So they will only be raised after, and that is what chapter 20 shows, after the Lord has come back to the earth with us. So you have indeed these three groups, but the third part of it cannot be there when the marriage feast takes place. And you have only these two groups. But I was going to say something about the elders. Sometimes it's suggested that they are angels. But I think the angels are more connected with the living creatures. And there are also clearly references to um, the elders here in chapter 5. You hope to see that, that they worship the land. Now we never find in the Bible that uh, angels worship the land. Angels, they pray to God. But they are not, they have no part in redemption. So, and there are many other, uh, proofs I think that the elders cannot be angels, which is often supposed. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it, but then you are gone, I think, that evening. But it doesn't matter, I'm glad you bring that up, because that shows that John's ministry has to do with the coming of the Lord. And so even, it's not mentioned that he comes back out of heaven. Of course he came back, but it is not mentioned. And so, uh, you see here how John's ministry is, tie, is tied up really, with the whole start of the coming of the Lord. Very important to understand. But it is important to understand that he was on earth when he saw the first vision, and that he was taken into heaven when he saw the second vision. And the only thing I said, we don't know how he was taken up there. If it was in a similar way as happened to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, he did not even know either if he was taken there bodily or just in his spirit, we don't know. But what we know, he became in the spirit. So. He was entirely available for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit could use him in this condition to show him everything and then that he could be the instrument to convey these things to us. That is what we see here in verse four, uh, verse 2. Well, we have come to um, the end of this series now and uh, I think this chapter really would help us to be impressed by the greatness of God. I, I was going to say that but I forgot it during the lecture but today we are living in an age where the concept of God is taken away from the mind of man as much as possible. We see it in school and in many ways in this society that the whole idea of 
the supreme God is entirely set aside. And so we have, we are very glad that we have a chapter like this, where we see the true God and all his greatness and his glory. And I really recommend you to read Ezekiel 1, which we cannot do now, but which would help you even more to understand his greatness and his glory. The book of Ezekiel is very helpful to that. So may the Lord help us. Thank you.